Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Forum for Dialogue and Diplomacy, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our board members, our guest, and our esteemed guest speaker, Mr. Stephen Payne and his team. We'll start tonight's proceedings by playing the national anthems of the two countries, Pakistan and the US. If you could, can you start, please? Back, that was only for board members, and tonight is the first public lecture of a series of events planned to build and strengthen stronger and better relations between the US and the Pakistan through positive dialogue and constructive engagement. I would like to thank Mr. Nasiruddin Rubali for sponsoring tonight's event. We would also like to thank and welcome our guests, our Turkish brothers from North American University for joining us, and those guests who were driven from out of town to join and attend today's lecture. Thank you for joining us. I think I will pause for a minute for this. It would give a better background. <laughs> And while we are waiting, we have been putting our, we have put and we will be putting this lecture on our forum's website. And um, if you could be kind enough to request your friends to follow our website page on Twitter and Facebook. Okay, so we'll start the recording. Pakistan and US relationship has been very interesting to say the least. Both have shared a relationship based primarily on national interests, most of the time common and shared, and sometimes conflicting and divergent. After the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Pakistan became America's blue-eyed boy, a strong ally in the region, 
and things were very cozy between the two countries. Following the Soviet withdrawal from the U.S., from Pakistan, so, uh, from following the Russian withdrawal from the Afghanistan soil, things started cooling down again a little bit between the two countries. Then 9-11 happened and the scenario changed. Today's lecture will revolve around exactly at that time when things between the two nations became very charged and tense, we are indeed privileged to have Mr. Payne, who will share an insider's view at this charge and tense time between the two countries. Mr. Payne's career in governmental affairs, public relations and energy consulting spans over 25 years. He has not only provided representation in governmental affairs to countries like Pakistan, Azerbaijan and the UAE, but also to blue chip corporations like JP Morgan, Continental Airlines, Boeing and Lockheed Martin among many others. During his long career in energy, in energy consulting, Mr. Payne has negotiated over 27 NTPA of LNG sales. On the political side, he reassembled a consortium of nations and international firms to build a natural gas pipeline from Turkmenistan to Pakistan. He also coordinated and organized a trilateral summit between the presidents of Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan regarding the TAPI pipeline, restoring the project's viability, which had been dormant for so many years. As an expert in the energy industry, Mr. Payne is frequently asked to comment on a wide variety of issues by major print and online media publications. Mr. Payne has also served as a senior presidential advanced representative of the White House. In this role, he traveled with President Bush and Vice President Cheney to Jordan for the Red Sea Summit the Middle East, Kazakhstan, and Afghanistan. He has also served as a board member of the National Defense University Foundation and was on the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Committee as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Stephen Payne. So I am very, very pleased to be here. And I wanted to specifically point out, thank you, uh, Javed, for inviting me. And I want to also call out my very, very good friend, uh, Ligari, who I've known for about 12 years now, and also uh, Sajad Berkey, who I've known a little bit less time, about four or five years now, but we've worked together a lot with, uh, with uh, Imran Khan. So what I'm going to do is, is mostly just tell you a lot, of, a lot of stories, how I started working with Pakistan, because... When I uh, was, was in, in around 2001, when I, had, when I went there, I'd really not been to that many places. I think I'd only left the United States a couple of times and then suddenly found myself in the midst of, uh, of international relations. But what happened was, was I was uh, very involved with George Bush. In 1988, I was his traveling aide when his father ran for president really wasn't a very spectacular or interesting job. It was just the son of the vice president and I was his traveling assistant and helped him get on time to his appointments and everything, but we developed a relationship then. And then when he ran for governor, I was a little bit involved there, but mostly I was working for our United States Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. But then in about 1997, I went out and I formed my own lobbying firm in Austin. And I had some clients like like uh, the space program and, and JP Morgan and some others. And I was involved with, with Governor Bush a little bit here in Harris County, but just as friends. Then in 99, uh, it was clear that he was going to run for president. And I went to him and I said, you know, I'm gonna help you. I wanna, I wanna travel with you and I want to raise money for you and I wanna play a big role in the campaign. So I did. And uh, I was the guy that uh, negotiated the debates with the Gore people, um, myself and Andy Card, who went on to become the chief of staff. And most of the people that 
were with the campaign went on to take a job in the White House, but I had young children at the time, so I chose not to. I chose to keep my lobbying business going, and I decided to take on some federal clients. Ward got around that, uh, that I was working and doing some things, and so I expanded my role with NASA and with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and others, but then uh, my friend General Lincoln Jones, who was here in, in Houston, asked me that if I would meet with him and uh, this new uh, military man that had become president of Pakistan by decree, of his own decree, and would I go there and, uh, and meet with him. So I did, and we went and we, we, we met with him in, I guess about April of 2001, Bush had just been elected president. And we went and we met and we talked mostly about energy projects because that's what Lincoln Jones was interested in. And I decided to, uh, to see what I could do there. And then we got into a conversation about, could you help us? You know, Mr. Payne, we know that you're very close to the president. We know that you didn't join the administration. Would you help us? And so we had a very specific conversation about what Pakistan could do and how we could improve relations because during Bush's father's time, there was the policy of the US was very much a parity. There was, there was to be parity between India and Pakistan. Both countries were, be, were to be treated equally and that was the policy. But in the Clinton administration, there was definitely a shift, a shift away from Pakistan and toward India. And so what once was a sort of an equal parity shifted away. And President Musharraf was very concerned about that. And he says, I want to get things back to equal. We even had a conversation about some guy named Osama bin Laden, which I'd never heard the name in my life. He says, I know he's somebody that y'all really want. Let us help you find him. We want to have a new cooperation on security. We want to bring the relationship back to, to uh, a, a good one. So I went and uh, considered it and decided that I wanted to take it on, but I wanted to sort of get the president's blessings first. So I went in June of 2001, and again, this is all before 9-11. I went in and met with uh, Pre President Bush and with uh, Condoleezza Rice, who was the national security advisor. We actually happened to all be in Poland where I was organizing his trip to Poland, but I had a few minutes to talk to him. And I told him about my, my conversation with President Musharraf. And Dr. Rice was there. And I went through everything. And after about five minutes, she stopped me and said, you know, Mr. President, we, I haven't heard any of this. Pakistanis aren't saying anything like this to us. They still seem quite uncooperative. They still seem like they don't want to work with us. And uh, the president looked at me and he says, are you sure you didn't misinterpret? And I said, no, sir, I even went back and recap the whole conversation. I know that I have it right. And he looked at Condoleezza Rice and he says, look, let Steve try this. He wants to be a back channel between President Musharraf directly and us, cutting out all the bureaucrats in between. Let's let him try it. I know him, I've known him for a long time. I trust Steve and I, I, he's, not, he's not stupid. I'm sure that he has it just right. Then he looks at me and he says, and if you get this wrong, we're gonna pretend that we don't even know you. I said, <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> that really gives me a, a vote of confidence. So that happened in, in June of 2001, and so we were off. We started uh, working together. We ultimately organized sort of our first meeting between Mahmoud, who was the head of the ISI at the time, and George Tenet, who was the head of the CIA. The meeting was scheduled for September 7th of 2001. And in the meantime, I went and, and was very bold in how I did these things. I kind of knew what the Pakistanis want and I knew sort of what the Americans want. So I wrote both lists of sort of what, what both sides wanted and sort of exchanged it with the other and said, here, here's what I think the US can do for you. Here's what, uh, what your Pakistan, here's what I think that Pakistan can do for you. So we went, we went through it. The meetings with Tenet were good and um, we exchanged our lists, and at the time, we were, we, we, our contract was with the ISI, I mean, with General Mahmoud directly. And we registered it properly. It was, we were the properly registered lobbyists of the government of Pakistan, but working for the, uh, the spy agency. And then 9-11 happened. 
I had just come back the day before and uh, it was obviously the whole world changed. And in fact, a little interesting aside, on 9-8, on the 8th of September, General Jones, who was a proud West Point grad, took General Mahmoud to uh, the West Point game. And I'd, I'd gone back to, to, to Houston. But they stayed in the Marriott Hotel at Newark Airport, two floors below two of the 9-11 hijackers. So you can imagine the FBI inquiries that we got over the next 10 days or so, coming to our offices, why were you there? What was, what's going on? The ISI, head of the ISI staying literally 100 feet away from two of the 9-11 hijackers. And obviously everything was cleared up very quickly, but I mean, this was a very, very interesting couple of days uh, of time. But when 9-11 happened, uh, we got in touch with uh, General Mahmoud and with his staff, and the, the message was clear. And the message was clear from us to them and from them to us that Pakistan would help the United States, that Pakistan would join this fight against terrorism. So Musharraf's statement made on the uh, 13th of September, but the evening of the 12th of September for the US was written by me. I wrote it. I faxed it to President Musharraf, and he wrote simply, okay, and signed it. We put it out on the Associated Press, and then he gave the speech about an uh, hour later on, on, on television. And it was word for word, exactly what we wrote is exactly what he said, how he declared his support to, uh, to help the United States. Those lists that we had written a couple months before were immediately thrown out and uh, you know, 500 new things were added. And it, it was a lot. It was a very, very strong relationship. Immediately, $38 billion in national debt was wiped away. Billions of dollars of military equipment were transferred, including the F-16s, which instead of giving F-16s, the Clinton administration wanted to give grain, as I'm sure you all remember that. Instead, they were given F-16s, they were given C-130s, they were given, uh, we, we were a key part of getting the major non-NATO ally status granted to Pakistan, which unfortunately Congress, uh, several members of Congress have been trying to take away for, for the last few years. Uh, the TAPI pipeline, which was mentioned in the, in the introduction, we got that uh, started by simply asking President Musharraf to sign a take or pay agreement for the gas, and that made it all, all possible. It ended with a, you know, not ended, but kind of really officially got started with a, with a, a trilateral meeting between the presidents of uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan. And so we did a lot to, to change the region. And I think for the next several years, U.S.-Pakistan relations were definitely on an uptick. Everything was going very well. Unfortunately, years later, it, it changed. I, I think that that's probably because I was no longer in the middle of it, uh, starting in about 2005. But uh, between 2001 and 2004, things were great. Both sides were very, very happy with the relationship. But there are some interesting things that happen even while we were happy with the relationship, some interesting stories that I've really never told publicly, but I think that they're, I think that they're interesting. So we all recall in December of 2001, there was an attack on the Indian parliament. And there was a lot of suspicion that Pakistan had, had directly been involved in the launching of this attack and all this. And I always wonder what would happen if gunmen walked into the US Congress and shot up several members of Congress. I mean, it would be a huge, a huge issue, really an act of war. And so this happened in early December of 2001. And then on about, well, not on about, on the 30th of December in the morning, it was a Friday morning, I remember it very well, I got a call from the colonel at the ISI who was, I was normally working with on a daily basis and he called and said, the president would like to speak to you tonight, your time, but his early Saturday morning. And I thought, okay, this has never happened before. We've only, I've only met Musharraf twice by this point and he'd never asked to speak to me at, at at home, but I said, okay, I'll be available at 11 o'clock tonight. But it was between Christmas and New Year's, so President Bush was off in Crawford, Texas, as he always did, 
and the staff was reduced. So he had Steve Hadley as his, uh, as the national security advisor. Dr. Rice was off with her family or whatever. So I called Hadley and I said, this is happening at 11. I'm going to call you about 11.15, 11.20, whatever it is, after President Musharraf tells me what he wants to tell me. Okay, fine. So we organize it all. Then that night at 11, somebody calls me. They said, please hold for the president of Pakistan. Then somebody else comes on. I found out later it was Major Tanvir, who was his, uh, uh, Musharraf's close aide. And then finally the president comes on. He says, Payne, how are you? Nice to hear from you. What do you... What are you doing for New Year's? And I said, oh, you know, we're going to a party. How about you, sir? Oh, I'm just going to have a glass of orange juice and I'll be in bed by 12.10. And, and, then, and then, then the conversation changed. And he says, Payne, I want to tell you something very seriously. He says, have you been following what's going on on our border? And I said, yes, sir. I know that there's some troops movement there. He says, no. He says, I want to explain it. There are 700,000 Indian troops on our border. And I think that they mean to come across and attack us. And I said, yes, sir, I, I understand. And he says, but I want you to really understand, 700,000 troops is twice the size of the entire United States Army. And they are on our border and they're about to come across and attack us. And I know my generals have briefed you on what happens if they come across that border. And I said, yes, sir, you lose after about four days. And he says, that's exactly right. He says, I need you to call your friend and I need you to tell him that if they come across that border, I'm going to use the nuclear weapons. And I'm thinking to myself, who's ever had a phone call like this in their life from somebody with actual nuclear weapons telling you that they're about to link on some nuclear weapons? Other than the guy who talks to Kim Jong-un, probably nobody. And I'm thinking, I'm, I get nervous, and I'm thinking he's with a phone in one hand and some red button device in another, and he's on the phone with me, and I said, geez, what am I, what am I doing here? So um, I said to him, I said, well, I'll pass this along right away, and I will get, you, get the message uh, delivered. And he says, okay, have a nice day. I look forward to hearing from somebody soon. So I called Hadley, and I said, I, I was nervous, and I said, this is what he said to me. And he says, yeah, that's kind of what we were expecting. And uh, I said, what are you going to do about it? I said, don't worry, we have a plan. And they, he hung up on me. He said, that's it. And so then the next morning I read that, uh, that, that he had called Vajpai and he had called Musharraf. And they had talked about everything. Musharraf told me a little bit about the conversation. I heard a little bit from the National Security Office. But basically what he called and said, he called Vajpai first. And he says, I have to focus I, I, Pakistan needs to focus on its western border. Do not distract them from the important mission that we have in Afghanistan, or you will be fighting more than Pakistan if you come across that border, and in, in in, inferring that the U.S. would get involved. And then with Musharraf, he simply called and said, you need to stop these cross-border incursions. And Musharraf protested and this was a topic of conversation that came up several times between me and Musharraf. My government would ask me to bring this up. I would bring it up and he would always say the exact same thing. He would say, Ping, there are 700,000 troops on that border. They could lock arms and cover the entire border. Nothing gets through that border. That border is secure and nobody gets across. And I can assure you that those people are already in India creating mischief. I can't do anything about it. Good answer. So. Later on, on one of Musharraf's trips to, uh, to Houston that, that Ligari sponsored later on, I asked Musharraf, I said, why did you do it this way? And he says, oh, it was simple. It was, it, was, it was a discussion and it was easy. If I were to call the US ambassador into my office and threaten him with nuclear war, then he would then report to the assistant secretary of state who would then report to Colin Powell, who would then report it back over to somebody who would then report it to the president. He said, with you, we could pick up the phone. We knew that you would be, it would be from us to you to one person and then directly to the president of the United States. And it would take five minutes instead of five hours of people writing memos and passing things back and forth. And then Musharraf then said, and with you, 
we could just pretend as though it never happened. So this seemed to be sort of the theory of what President Bush told me, what President Musharraf told me, and total deniability of, of anything ever taking place. So that was, uh, that was how it was done. They, they discussed it. They decided that they were going to use the goofy person sitting down in Houston as the uh, deliverer of their message. But then the same thing happened on the other side. The, some U.S. officials approached me and said, you know, we have a problem. We think that the Pakistanis are delivering nuclear weapons to other countries, mainly North Korea. We're not sure about it, but we think so. And so we're going to give you some materials and we want you to go present them to President Musharraf. So they gave me a book. And, the, and they told me how to go through the book and to show it to President Musharraf, nobody else. So I did. I went to the office and in Islamabad, and we started flipping through the book. And I said, this is a picture of North Korea, as you see. Now let's focus on this area. This is Pyongyang. Flip the page. This is Pyongyang. Now this is the airport up here. Let's focus on this. Flip the page. Here's the airport. Now see this plane here. Flip the page. It's a Pakistani plane. And then that's when I started going through saying, there's a suspicion that you've been delivering uh, nuclear technology and, and uh, missile technology to the North Koreans. And he wasn't expecting, I don't think, to hear this from me. And they, I don't think he'd ever heard it from anybody. So he started yelling at me, yelling at me to the point where his guards burst into the back of the office thinking that I was killing him or something. Then they realized he's just yelling at me. So then they looked and they walked back out and said, uh, he's just yelling at the stupid American. So. That was, uh, that was that. But then he calmed down and, and I said, you've, you've got to do something about this. And he says, he says, this gentleman that you want me to put in prison is a hero. He is like, it would be like going back in the American Revolution and telling somebody to put Benjamin Franklin in jail. Aku Khan is a hero and I would be killed, lynched, if I did anything to him. And I said, I, you know, I don't know, Mr. President, just put him under house, or say it's jail, but just let him live in a palace, whatever. But you've, you've got to do something because my country is very upset about this and they feel like you're, you're proliferating the nuclear weapons. So anyway, we, we all know what happened. He, he put Khan in, in, he let Khan stay in his nice home, and, but he made him, um, made him stay there alone. So it was, these were all the interesting things that, that happened. Uh, I was more of just, a, I guess, a tool of diplomacy or of, of back-channel diplomacy than anything, but it was, it was an interesting time. Later on, after several years, uh, Musharraf and I stayed in, in, in touch with each other, and, uh, and, but then I actually went to work for Imran Khan in uh, 2019. We all know that uh, Pakistan and Bunam put on the Fatif Grey List which used to be a due diligence for some sort of a banking project. The packets would maybe be like this. Once you're on the gray list, the packets are like this. They want to know who your second cousin's wife is. And it just the, the financial intensity was incredible. And it was costing the Pakistani economy billions and billions of dollars to be on the FATF gray list. So we, we managed to look at the problem under Imran and FATF had found Pakistan to be deficient in 27 issues. And by the time that I got involved, they had resolved five of them, but there were still 22 unresolved. We worked very closely with the Trump administration in getting Pakistan off of the gray list. And by the time the Trump administration was over, they were down to just one issue. For some reason, the U.S. and FATF had decided that there's one guy that needed to be put in jail that was suspected of some terrorism issues and things like that. Finally, it took another year, he got taken off the list, and then finally Pakistan got taken off the gray list in May of this year. So I was glad to at least accomplish about 90% of what Pakistan needed to get that, uh, to get that done. Um, thank you, thank you. The, uh, the Indian press, when we first came out and did, and now I'll just say something about the Indians. I, I wor was working with the Indians a lot in 2013 and 2014 on LNG issues. And I had a, a, a chance to meet with the Indian foreign secretary, 
a guy named Jay Shankar, who is now the Indian foreign minister. And he, when I walked in, he says, I've really been looking forward to meeting you because I was U.S. ambassador when you quickly came in and in about 90 days undid about eight years of our work, just wiped it off the table immediately. And he says, I've always wanted to meet you. But he was a very nice, nice guy about it and everything. But uh, I think when, when the Indians heard that I was taking this on for FATF, they were irritated by it. And so they were attacking me directly. The Indian foreign ministry was saying, oh, Payne will never get this done. He, you know, he worked for them before. He had some accomplishments, but he'll never get this done. So happy to say that we were able to get it done. I, 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 wanna, I know we're, we're already past time here, so I'll, I'll keep it... Uh, Keep it quick, but I'm, I, I'm troubled by the situation in Pakistan now as though as I'm troubled with the situation in the U.S. politically. Uh, you see a time now where current leaders are going back and attacking foreign leaders and, I mean, former leaders and raiding their homes in Mar-a-Lago in the case of here in the U.S. or in, 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 um, in Pakistan putting the former prime minister on the terrorist terrorism list, but clearly he is the most popular politician in the country, clearly. I mean, it's much more clear in Pakistan than it is here in the U.S. In the U.S., I'll grant it and say, it's a 45-45 situation with about 10% that shift back and forth. In Pakistan, clearly by the elections that we've seen lately and all the polls, clearly Imran is the, is the people's choice, at least for now. And um, it's a dangerous slope when, when we have situations where former governments are, are basically trying to arrest their predecessors. That is not democracy here. It's not democracy there. It's not democracy anywhere. And with that, I just want to give that cautionary note. And I look forward to, uh, to taking your questions in a few minutes. We're going to do the questions after, right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. If the crowd allows me, I would like to ask the first question. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my first question actually to you is, uh, from what I hear, you said two-time lobbyist. The first time you worked for General Parvez Musharraf and the second time for Prime Minister Imran Khan. Is that correct? That's right. I see two very differing opposing policies of the two presidents where General Musharraf joined the war on terror and Prime Minister Imran Khan said, well, we do not want to be a part of any wars. And you were representing both head of states. So what is your position on that? You know, I think the one thing that those two gentlemen have in common is that they both were acting on behalf of Pakistan, what they thought was in the best interest of Pakistan, without any kind of self-enrichment of themselves or their friends or anyone else. I honestly think they were honest people who were trying to do the best job that they could do. Uh, this is the common thread that I think it was between the two of them. Thank you. Yes, Siraj. And please try to introduce yourself when you ask a question. Uh, my name is Siraj Darcy. Uh, we were talking about personal 9-11, but I wanted to go back into history a little bit. Uh, I was too young to remember part of my Reagan onwards. Am I right to say uh, that there is an impression that most democratic administrations are not too friendly to Pakistan, whereas the Republican administrations generally have been good to Pakistan? Is there a particular reason? Is this just an observation or impression? Is that true? And if true, what are your views on that? Certainly in the time that I've been involved, that has proven to be true. Uh, we, we were looking at the time of Bush 41 administration. It was that parody that I discussed before. And then in the Clinton administration, there was definitely a shift away from Pakistan and towards India. And then this is what Musharraf wanted to try to get back. And this is what I think the Bush administration did a good job of doing, of trying to keep parity between the two and show show a lot of help and support for both countries. So certainly in, in, the, in the administrations that I was directly involved with, that's the case. Uh, certainly President Trump and, and Imran got along very, very well. They had a good personal relationship 
And now that seems to not so much be the case with the Biden administration. I don't really have a strong opinion on what was going on with the Obama administration, but I think in general that's probably uh, probably accurate. Yes. Hello. No. Don't look at it. All right. Uh, my name is Aram Farooq. I was uh, in this uh, provincial assembly in Pakistan. I wanted to ask you one thing, which I always wanted to ask somebody from the uh, U.S. administration, that um, when Musharraf said, either you are with us, he said that Bush had said to him, either you are with us or you're not. And that was the reason for Pakistan to be a part of uh, the Afghanistan war. Uh, you can say yes or no on that. And then the second thing is, um, do you think it was wise decision that Pakistan had lost so much because of the Afghan war? Was it a wise decision from Musharraf that we went in a war which was not even ours and we are still facing the consequences right now? Thank you. So two things. I think, I think number one, it was... Uh, Probably not so much President Bush that gave that strong ultimatum. I think that it was more uh, Armitage, who was the uh, Deputy Secretary of, uh, of, of State at the time. He gave that, that message directly to General Mahmoud. Um, and, but Musharraf was very quick to, after we had a quick conversation on the 12th of September, to come on board and in a, and in a strong way. As whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision, I think uh, certainly at the beginning it was it was a good decision. Uh, the Pakistan economy and the welfare of the country and everything improved significantly over the first few years after 9-11. But I think just like in the U.S., I mean, people got tired of it. It began to be a drag financially and, and in loss of lives and everything. And so I think it went on too long. Um, I think that they could have, there's a lot of ways that they could have sped up the, uh, the, 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 res the resolution of the Afghan situation. And now here we are again, basically right back to where we were in the year 2000. I mean, I don't think that there's much difference of Afghanistan right now versus the Afghanistan of 2000. So unfortunately, everything was a, was a, was a waste, really. It's what it boiled down to. Anybody else? I feel really important having two mics in my hand. So, Mr. Payne, um, if you could kindly shed some light of uh, about the events surrounding Osama bin Laden's capture, because the impression in Pakistan, the common impression and the popular belief in Pakistan at that time was that somehow Pakistan's sovereignty had been infringed upon. Um, it was a good act, but uh, perhaps the PR around that capture was not handled well. So if you could be kind enough to share in some interesting details, if you can. Thank you. Now, one of the things I can tell you about that is that this was something that actually President Musharraf would joke around with me about. He would say to me, he would say, so we have bin Laden in a, in a cell. When do you want us to let him out and give him to you? And he would, we would laugh and everything. And then, and then when he was finally captured, of course, this was, what, four years after Musharraf was out of power when, when Osama bin Laden was finally captured. I asked him, I said, so did you know that he was there? And he says, Payne, we, you paid us $100 million a month to look for bin Laden. If we knew where he was, we would have put him somewhere where he couldn't have just gotten in a car and driven away like he could any time. In that house where he was, he had the freedom to leave any time he wanted. And if we knew where he was, we would have put him somewhere in a cell and had you keep paying us the $100 million while we put for him together. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his response to me. It, it certainly makes sense. Certainly, if they knew, I don't think that they would have given him the kind of uh, ability to change his situation at any time, which he could have done. He could have gotten in a car and driven away any day. 
One thing, one, one an interesting aside, I'll just, just to tell, this is sort of back to the beginning of the relationship in 2000, uh, 2001. The reason Musharraf liked this very streamlined approach from him to the ISI and a colonel via fax or phone call to me and then straight into the administration. That was our line of communication because he didn't trust his ambassador. She was uh, appointed by his predecessor and he didn't trust her, her Malia Lodi, nice lady, but uh, he, he didn't trust her. And we ran everything without her even knowledge. She would basically just be sitting at her desk and I guess somebody would call her from the administration and say, okay, we gave you another $2 billion for this. And she said, okay, thank you. And she had nothing to do with anything that was going on. She just got to take credit for all of the work that we were, we were doing until one day she, she in, in fact, I would even meet with Musharraf in Washington when he would be there and she would be sitting outside and, uh, and I would come out, and he, she knew who I was, but she didn't dare say anything to me, and then I would leave. And, and then, um, funny thing, I was with Sajab, uh, with, with Berkey, a few years ago, and we went and met with Imran at uh, the UN. And we walked out, just he and I and Atif walked out with Imran, and she was there as ambassador to the UN, and I just saw this look on her <laughs> face like she was terrified. Oh no, it's happening again. <laughs> He's gonna circumvent me, but no, we didn't. She she didn't know anything about what we were doing, and uh, finally one day she called me and she demanded to meet with me. And I called Islamabad and they said, okay, meet with her, but don't tell her anything different than what she would tell a member of Congress that you were meeting with or something like that. So I went and met with her and she lectured me about this and that. And I said, you know, Madam Ambassador, you've got to take credit for a lot of really fantastic developments between our two countries. So be happy for me. She didn't like that response much. Anyway. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my name is... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yes. My name is Akram Arai. Can you? And Akram Arai, and I have one question for you. Why U.S. government is always opposes any project in Pakistan and keep it as a welfare state, like a gas pipeline from Iran to Pakistan, gas pipelines from Central Asia to Pakistan, CPAC project, anything else. Every project Pakistan starts, there is a huge opposition on that one. Uh, what's the main reason for You mean that? from the Indians or Americans, the sanctions? No, but I, think, I think the Americans are, are supportive of these pipelines. I mean, the Americans were funding the Asian Development Bank's efforts for the TAPI pipeline even recently. And I'll tell you an aside, a project that, uh, that I'm working on now with Atif to bring electricity to Pakistan. And it's basically the same thing as the Tapi gas pipeline, but it's, it's more direct. We are working with a Turkish company called Chalak Energy, where they have a huge uh, power plant in Turkmenistan. And we were gonna bring an electric wire directly to Pakistan across Afghanistan, and then electrify uh, Pakistan. And cheaply too. Uh, the, currently the uh, Pakistan is paying uh, about 11 cents per kilowatt hour for its coal plants that were built by the Chinese, and we were going to offer this power for uh, 6.9 cents. So it was a huge uh, savings for the government, and it was clean, as opposed to coal is very dirty and causing the smog in, in, uh, in Islamabad. But unfortunately, we just couldn't get past the, um, the problems that the contracts had already been signed, probably with people that were lining their own pockets and nobody in the lower levels of the government would uh, would give us what we needed to be and that was for the betterment of the people of Pakistan. The reason I bring this up is U.S. wasn't opposed to this at all. U.S. and Turkish governments were both pushing hard for this project, wanted it to happen, realized it was better for the people of Pakistan to reduce their electricity rates by 30 percent, but we just couldn't get it past the bureaucracy who I guess had all been paid off. What can we Pakistani Americans residing in America do? One, two, three, four, five. Exact, give us some uh, specific things that we can do to strengthen US and Pakistan ties while sitting here in America. Yep. So 
follow the follow the Armenians and <laughs> and the Israelis. I mean, there are really not that many Armenians in the United States, yet they are an absolutely powerful lobby in Washington because they get unified. A couple thousand of them will show up in Washington on the same day and they'll organize themselves in the morning and they'll make sure that every congressional office is visited by a group of Armenians to push their, push their agenda, which is usually an anti-Azerbaijan, uh, anti-Turkey agenda. But follow what they do, because what they do is very, very effective. And yet you have many, many, many more people than here in the U.S. than, than uh, the Armenians do. Organize yourselves into a strong diaspora, give political money, all show up on the same day, go and visit your congressman and insist on being heard and insist, and insist on the, uh, the relationship getting better. The Pakistan caucus is unfortunately... I think it's nine members now, and this is abysmal, abysmal. And it should be, you know, the, pa the Pakistan caucus should be eight to 10 times that, and it's not. And it just needs, to, the, the, the diaspora just needs to organize itself better through the embassy, and uh, I'm sure that it can be done. You have a lot, of, you have plenty of resources, plenty of people to get involved. You're in, you're in, I'm sure all 50 states have, have plenty of Pakistani Americans there. And so you can be influential if you just organize yourselves and get it done. Well, we started off here. Exactly. <laughs> and Kaiser, thank you for coming. Kaiser is my very good friend, best chef in Houston. <laughs> yes, next. Quick question. You know, I know media is designed to sell negative you. news, and every day when I read newspaper, right, from Pakistan, you get depressed, right? The news are yeah. not good. So I said, you know, news is negative, economics, flood, etc. What trajectory you see that are positive things that are happening in Pakistan, you know, few items that you think is a positive trajectory, and piggybacking on his question, what can we do to capitalize on that? So I'm, to be honest, I'll go back to, to my speech. I'm troubled by what I see in Pakistan now because I think that there's been actually a, a roll backwards away from representative democracy. Uh, I was delighted to see the, the law change where, where, there's, where women are now a predominant part of the parliament in Pakistan. And these are things, these were positive things that happened in uh, the early 2000s. And I think that a representative democracy was, was moving forward quite, quite well. And there was a lot of positive news. Unfortunately, um, there was some, you know, some, some greed that took place amongst, amongst some officials and that kind of rolled things backwards a little. But what's going on now is even a roll back even further where, where, you're, where, where Pakistan is, is jailing um, or attempting to jail its former leaders and their, their staff, uh, you know, the Imran's uh, chief of staff was put in jail for 60 days and I think tortured and this is just not the right, uh, right direction. So I think there just needs to be a sort of an overturn, a refreshment of relations inside the country. And then I think there can be a restoration of good relations between the US and Pakistan. Pakistan is an important ally it's been, I, I would say that it's been a more reliable partner overall over the years from 1947 to now than, than India has been. And uh, because India, you know, plays around with the Russians a lot and did all the way through the uh, Soviet times. And I think Pakistan has been a more substantive and reliable partner and we just need to get back to those days. Okay. <coughs> Okay, Steve, uh, I know you have worked with a lot of world leaders and you have been friends with a lot of world leaders. First of all, my question is, uh, how was your experience with Prime Minister Khan? How did you find him different than the other world leaders? That's my question. And one thing which I want to tell the audience here is, uh, you know, when we signed a contract, a lobbying contract with Stephen Payne, it was a $1.2 million contract. 
But since uh, it was year 2020, it was election year and there was COVID. Uh, I would like to tell, first first thing is it was a zero, zero dollar contract. Uh, it, it was the first time in the history of Pakistan that Pakistan government has signed a lobbying contract in the US for which government of Pakistan was not paying for it. It, you know, it was diaspora funded. But by the time when we were uh, supposed to pay Steve, you know, Steve did not charge us a penny for lobbying for Pakistan in that one year. You know, just because, uh, you know, he said it was election year and it was a COVID year, we could not do much, though he did a lot, like he just mentioned, all the 27 points he helped Pakistan on Fatif. Uh, but still, uh, Steve, more than a lobbyist, I know you're a good friend of Pakistan and a good friend of Prime Minister Imran. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, thank you. So I met, I met Imran in 2003 when he wasn't even in parliament yet. He was just a, a former cricketer. I met him, I was introduced to him by uh, Sheikh Nayan, the, the, one of the rulers of, of Abu Dhabi. He introduced me and he, he, you know, he knew that I was working closely with Pakistan at the time. And that's when we first met and we didn't stay in close touch until you, Atif and, and Berkey, it reintroduced me to Imran, but I'll say the same thing that I did before, which is simply that he's an honest man. I think that he truly believes that he's trying to do what's right for the country. I don't think he's trying to make any money. He already has plenty of personal wealth, and I think he's just trying to do the right thing. And this is the one thing that I saw in President Musharraf as well, is just gentlemen trying to do what's best for the country without trying to enrich themselves or their friends. Okay. Uh, my name is Barkat Chagalian. In the first of this lecture series, we were told that countries have interests and not friends. And I think you, what you said here corroborates that fact that really the countries have interests and they work on the workers. Can you tell us as to what can both administrations do with your long experience, or almost four or five administrations here and two administrations there? What can both administrations do to converge that interest and make sure the kind of misunderstanding that has happened recently does not happen? Yeah. Thank you. One of the things that I wish would have happened at, toward the end of the Afghan mm -hmm. conflict is when the U.S. was making it clear that they wanted to leave, it was unfortunate that we didn't simply turn all the equipment and basically hand everything over to the Pakistani army. This is something that I was supporting. This is something that I spoke to General Bajwa about. I thought it would have been in the best interest of both countries. I think if we would have done that um, through two, three years ago, at the, right when the Trump administration was closing down and the Biden administration was starting, I think that the situation in Afghanistan would be well under control by the Pakistan army, who would be basically utilizing all of our equipment, and uh, we wouldn't have just thrown it back into the, into the hands of the Taliban again. This was a big mistake, and this is something that could have happened a couple of years ago that would have been, I think, in the best interest of both countries. Um, and, then, and there are other things, too. Certainly, uh, you know, as, as a containment of Iran and other issues, uh, Pakistan could help. But I think that there needs to be sort of a trust rebuilt between the two between the two countries, and this is something that I think with uh, between Imran and, and uh, President Trump, there was a, there was a, a a personal relationship there. Unfortunately, now with the current administration, it's uh, it's just not going in the right the right direction. And I think this comes back to your question: Is are the Democrats more favorable towards uh, India than Pakistan? And I think that. You can use this administration as a pretty clear example that that's probably the case. Yes, Sajad. Hi, Steve Sajad Berkey. Uh, kind of a follow up on what Dr. Charania was talking about. Um, I'm very interested in the current situation, uh, and, or what I might call the relationship, current relationship between Pakistan and the US, which has apparently gone sour in the last one year, or I don't know if it's been longer. Um, there's been a lot of talk about a cipher that was sent 
uh, from our ambassador. Yep. Uh, by, some comments made by the Under Secretary David Donald Lu, yep. uh, which was not taken lightly by our Prime Minister Imran Khan at that time, and which was uh, uh, considered a direct attack uh, on the democracy of that country. Uh, a conspiracy is what they, they wanted to call it. My question is, give us your view on how the relationship can be improved. What is it that Pakistan or our leadership in Pakistan can do to improve our relationship with the U.S. and what concessions can the, uh, uh, the U.S. make towards Pakistan? And again, uh, one more time, I'm, all, I'm curious uh, as to whether the, the, this whole deterioration has been a U.S. policy, or is this a Republican and a Democratic thing? You know, kind of, is it a policy of the U.S. to do what they done to Pakistan, or it was just the Biden administration that decided to send a cipher? I, you know, I don't even know that it was actually the Biden administration that gave permission for this message to be delivered. It could just be some mid-level bureaucrat at the State Department that decided on his own that he had some sort of personal relationship with the former prime minister and decided that he wanted to try to send words of encouragement, thinking it was just a private message or something, not knowing that it would be leaked out. But whatever it is, definitely the U.S. needs to try to move past that. But so does Pakistan. I mean. We can't just flush the relationship down the toilet over one over what one bureaucrat said to somebody in Pakistan. So it's it's the U.S. needs to to deny the the uh, the, the memo, and at the same time, Pakistan needs to say, okay, let's put this past and move on. I think once we get to that point, I think there is a possibility to try to get some things back on on track. Certainly, Pakistan could help in Afghanistan. This is this is now used to not be a problem, now it's a problem again for the, for the U.S. And it is going to be, ultimately, it's going to be just like the year 2000, 2001, where it comes back and becomes a problem, where the wrong people are going to be operating there. And this is somewhere where Pakistan and Pakistan intelligence and th these kinds of things could be done to help the situation. Um, you know, we're right back where we were 21 years ago, unfortunately. But, uh, but I think Pakistan can play a role that's helpful. My name is uh, Jasim Pasha, and uh, I have a question regarding the word you use, allies. I always feel very intrigued by this word. I think it's good. And uh, you were saying that Pakistan has been a good ally of USA. The last 75 years, as compared to India, you are much more closer to the USA. My question is how come India can get away with all the sanctions and uh, is able to import gas from Russia while USA is on the other side? But when Pakistan in this situation, is unable to do that. So, uh, what's going on with the concept of allies? Is there somebody who is more aggressive? The definition of ally changes, or is there something else? Thank you. Yeah. So, technically, Pakistan is a major non NATO ally. Technically, actually, how are you? You uh, describe it. It's it's in the law, and these are these are the U.S.'s closest friends. This is Korea, Japan, Pakistan, Australia, the Philippines. These are big, important countries that have that very, very distinct status, and um, it's one that I'm very proud that I helped uh, orchestrate this in, in 2003, 2004 time frame, and. I think that the title speaks for itself. Now, there are certain members of Congress who want to take that away, 
and that would be unfortunate. But we need to, again, a lot of the questions have, have surrounded about how to rebuild the relationship, and I think that, that that should be a focus of everybody here. And the diaspora could have a lot to do with that, in getting a lot of, of uh, support in Congress and the administration by simply letting your voices heard. Pakistan's a very large diaspora in, uh, in the United States, and you have plenty of people and resources to make your voices heard and to change things quickly. Again, follow the Armenians. They're very, very effective at it with far, far fewer people. Okay. Thanks, Kavran. Yes, the uh, question I have is that uh, a lot of words have been used here, friendship, relationship. Friendship and relationship is based on mutual trust and respect. No. When was the last time you thought, you think, in your opinion, USA and Pakistan had the respect and the trust both at the same time? That's a, that's a hard question. I mean, it's, it's there, it, I think like with any relationship, it ebbs and flows. I mean, I think there are times of, of respect and friendship. And then I think that there's times where there's, where there's problems. I think certainly during the Musharraf times, there were certainly some, some times of very, very good cooperation. I also think that during, um, during the, uh, the, the Imran, Han and Trump era, there was some, some, some times of, uh, at least the two leaders were, were exchanging very positive views of each other. Uh, they've known each other, by the way, since before either of them were in politics. Uh, this was something that helped also. Uh, you know, and I think there were some times when, when the two countries were, again, were getting along, even during the Obama administration. But, you know, it's, a, it's an up or down. It depends on what's going on in the, in the world at the time. But it would be good to get it a little bit more consistent consistent on the positive side instead of the negative side. And I think, again, this is somewhere where the diaspora can play a role as both back-channel communications and just getting the Congress to get more involved in helping uh, Pakistan and improving the relations. Hi, this is Shazia Yankoub. I am actually not diaspora. I, I've just come from Pakistan for a little while. Um, in your experience, what did you think was the hardest thing of um, working with the Pakistani government? And what, uh, do you, what would you recommend Pakistanis uh, should uh, act for change to make it easier for U.S. Uh, government to work with Pakistanis in a positive manner to get, achieve the goal that we want to uh, yeah, I, I, again, I think that the, one of the biggest problems right now is a uh, lessening or a retreat from representative democracy, and it's it's not only in it's it's not only a problem here, it's or in Pakistan, but it's also a problem here. You know, in our in our country, even where we are a fifty fifty nation, the two sides are fighting with each other too much, and I think this is an impediment. To, uh, I think this is an impediment to Pakistan because the political parties are warring against each other and it's no longer debate, it's no longer uh, just differences of opinion. Now it's just all out war. And we're seeing the same thing happen here in the United States. And it's, it's nobody benefits from this kind of uh, dysfunction, if you will. Thank you. Well, we'll take two last questions. Uh, it's a great honor to listening to you. I have two small but question but great meanings. That uh, why the Republican government are the Democratic, both of them, not putting as much pressure on India that what they are doing with the minority especially the Muslims. And second is what they are doing in Kashmir for the last so many years. But uh, the world is seeing, especially the Muslim, Pakistani, American, or in Pakistan, they don't feel that the American, both uh, parties, Democrats or Republicans, not putting as much pressure as supposed to the, what the, what's the, especially the Moody government is doing for the last so many years. Sure. Yeah, I find it, I find it very interesting 
that uh, Prime Minister Modi was literally on the OFAC sanctions list the day before he became uh, Prime Minister. And then he was taken off once he was elected Prime Minister. It's a very interesting thing. But the, you know, and then you look at the Kashmir situation. I fell into a trap once with President Musharraf and I, I went to him and I asked him to get involved in, in what we were trying to do with the UN on Iraq. This was in 2003. I went and I saw him in, in Islamabad. And I said, sir, can you get involved and please pass, uh, help us pass a UN resolution, help the US do this. They've, I've been asked to, uh, to bring this up with you. And he said, yes, absolutely. We will come on board. We will do the resolution. We will do everything, but we have one condition. We need the US to strongly enforce the already existing UN resolutions regarding Kashmir. <laughs> and I knew that was a, a non-starting conversation. So we ended the conversation quickly, but he was right. I mean, we can't, that's, that sort of shows a duplicity in the US and their policy that we were insisting that other countries come on board with our, in supporting our UN resolutions. Yet at the same time, we were disregarding UN resolutions that were 50 years old at the time. Okay. We have one last question. Two co last questions, okay. Which I personally was not uh, known that. But uh, I have two questions. One was asked to ask by my older brother, Mr. Gulfras Khan Aradika, that question. So I'm not going to ask that question about Kashmir. But the second question is, you just mentioned that some Congress men or women in the United States try to take a special position of Pakistan and they're working hard to take that position from this Congress. I would like to know if you have a knowledge what is says do congressmen are and who are they and which state they are trying to take Pakistan that is special status. I will appreciate if you let us know that. Thank you. Yeah, um, one of them, one of the ones that was the main uh, person pushing to take away the uh, major non-NATO ally status was uh, a congressman named Ted Poe. And I, so I agree with Ted on many, many issues. He was actually my congressman in the Heights area of Houston. Good guy, he was just wrong on this, uh, this particular issue. But he's no longer in Congress. He's now been replaced by Dan Crenshaw. And uh, I think Cren Crenshaw has a much more realistic view of, 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 of the world. He actually served in Afghanistan, lost his eye there. So there are some, and I could go back and, and, and look at which ones are trying to take it away. But Poe used to be one of the primary ones. He was on foreign relations and was uh, trying to push it, uh, push that back. And by the way, I thank you for welcoming me to to Sugarland, but I actually just live in the next town over, a town called Fulcher. So okay. I live about 20 minutes away. Wonderful. We have one last question. Okay, okay well, this would be the last question, please. Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Salma Mirza. Um, so my question, you mentioned that Pakistan yeah. still has a role in Afghanistan. I was wondering what kind of role you expect Pakistan to play um, since the last 30 or 50 years, we've had a covert operation there as well as, you know, US had a, had a military intervention there as well. We had an all out war there as well. And then after the, you know, the optics of the way US left in Afghanistan, we, 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 you know, everybody has a, a strong opinion about, about the, the optics of that. So what kind of role Pakistan can play still in your mind uh, in case of Afghanistan? Well, if we could go back about uh, 18 months ago, it would be a much better situation. I was an advocate for simply turning over all the military equipment to, uh, to General Bajwa. I told him this directly, that we should advocate, we should work together to get that done and have the Pakistan army come in and secure the peace in Afghanistan. And I think this is something that could have been achieved 18 months ago. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's a mess. I think now all Pakistan can do is provide some good intelligence. They obviously have some good relations with the, uh, or at least have cooperative relationships with the Taliban uh, government. Um, 
I think the Taliban government will be a little bit smarter in how they deal with things to not bring uh, the U.S. back in and, and attacking them. But I, I don't think that they've really changed their stripes at all. And I think Pakistan could play a bridge to doing that. You know, certainly it's not Qatar. I mean, Qatar's population is much, much smaller than the Pakistani army. So it's, it's, a, it's silly to think that they could really play a role, a, a real role in any kind of major uh, situation like Afghanistan. So I think Pakistan is the natural to turn to, to help keep that relationship uh, between the U.S. and Afghanistan under control. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stephen Payne. I think it was extremely informative and a number of revelations that you made post 9-11, including pre-9-11 when you were living in the hotel and when it happened in Washington, D.C. But let me warn you, all your talk is going to be on YouTube, so okay. beware. Right. Fine. Whether you would be able to go back to Pakistan <laughs> again. <laughs> and at this point, Sarah, would you please present a token of appreciation? I still have one controversial question which I'll ask in a while. Sure. First, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, this is a traditional, you know, a Sindri Ajrak that is being gifted to you by your good friend, Nawab Saif Lagari. He specially brought this thing in for you. Super, super. So, Thank you. So this you would have to put on your shoulder like this. Okay. Good. Super. Okay, and then. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It's indeed you. very enlightening. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And just one more, I'll just take a few minutes of some housekeeping announcements. First of all, let me acknowledge the people behind it all that made this thing happen. Starting off with the board people, the chairman of the board, Mr. Barkat Charania, Nasruddin Rupani, who was uh, the sponsor of this event. We missed you in the beginning. I'm glad you are finally here. Mr. Harun Sheikh. And then, of course, the executive board, which includes our very intelligent, active secretary, Sara Wahid Chair. We have Dr. Javed Ashraf, he's somewhere here. Javed Ashraf is here. Then those who have actually not been able to make it is Dr. Ahmed Durrani, Dr. Kamran Asdar, and Dr. Amna Kutub were, were not able to because they are either out of the country or on travel within the US. And in particular, I would also like to acknowledge two of our very useful members, uh, Mariam Khan out here and Afshin Charania. I think without these two wonderful ladies, we would not have been able to accomplish what we have been able to do here today. And one last final announcement before food is served. Make sure that you have signed your name in or at least put a tick mark against your name at the front end. If your name is not there, please make sure you write it because we have to give a copy of this list to the ISI. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much and thank you for being here. Thank you.